I'm thankful and honored to be here um, with this topic. It's always, it's always a little scary because you never know who you're talking to and you never know the backgrounds of the people that you're talking to or the feelings uh, that are had. But the thing about what's right is regardless of how it may make some feel, right is right. Amen? Wrong is wrong. And it tells us we got to talk about things when it makes us comfortable and when it makes us uncomfortable. And that's the only way we can grow uh, and become better. There's a passage in scripture that says iron is supposed to sharpen iron, right? And when you look at that experience, sparks fly sometimes or a lot of times. And it's never pleasant, but it always ends up making both sides better. And so today I want to talk about some things, and uh, we'll have a period of time at the end for some questions. Uh, I don't speak for all black people. I don't have all the knowledge in the world about racism, but I do want to allow a conversation to happen, and uh, hopefully uh, we're all better for it in the long run. So racism, we all have an idea. Uh, the best definition I could find is hate directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership of a particular racial or ethnic group. We're all familiar with that. But some things that we forget is that racism has been in existence since time has been in existence. It is not an American invention. It's not a new thing that's just happened, but it's been even in scripture that we can read about um, these type of issues that have come up. Uh, we can think all the way back uh, to the Old Testament where we think about uh, Moses had a black wife. And remember, his brothers and sisters had an issue with that, right? It wasn't popular with them. And they had some things to say, and God had to handle that uh, in a certain fashion. Uh, it is not new. Scripture speaks about it. Scripture tells us how we should handle it. Uh, we can even think back and see how the Jews treated non-Jews, even in the New Testament and Old Testament. So we're able to see already uh, that this has been in existence for a while. It's nothing new. And it lets us know that people, left to their own devices, will find a way to group up with like people to unlike people that are different. Does that make sense? And so I believe if there were no skin color at all, if we were all the same color, we would find some reason to dislike another group of people, whether it be because they're Vols fans, oops, or, or maybe it's because they're Alabama fans, oops. Or, or, or maybe their hair color or their eye color. We would find a way, but that there's no place for that in God's church. Amen? Like there's no place for any group of people to dislike another group of people in the kingdom of God. And so I want to talk about some passages and kind of get this ball rolling and make sure uh, I'm as clear as possible uh, when sharing this message. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, just to give context, in, 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 in verse 9 it says, Paul... Uh, Paul wrote, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister that's a member of the body, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler, do not even associate with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside, but expel the wicked person from among you. So why read this passage? TJ, this has nothing to do with race. Clearly, this has to do with other sins. But what I'm trying to point at is... This conversation that we're having, we're not talking about the racism out in the world. There's supposed to be hate out in the world. There's supposed to be racism out in the world because in the world they don't know Christ. And they're supposed to live that way because they don't know any better. However, in the body, in Christ's body, in the church, this has no place. And so we're talking about racism that has existed that has lived, that has bred, that has infiltrated the one entity on the face of this earth that shouldn't have it, it has infiltrated the Lord's body, and we've got to talk about it. We can't do anything if we continue to act like it's not there. We can't make it any better. 
And so I asked Matt a question, and I asked his father a question. And I have no clue how this is going to go. My fingers are crossed that it makes sense. So Matt, if you would get your piece of paper out, and sir, if you would get your piece of paper out as well. I asked them a simple question. I don't want you to tell me that question yet. I just want you to tell me your answers. And as he says a state's name, I want you to see if yours matches. All right? So he's going to tell me some state's names. And anytime you have a matching state, you're going to say, we got a match. Got me? All right, go for it. No match, okay. Key. Match. Arkansas. No match, all right. North Carolina. All right. Oklahoma. All right. Texas. Match. All right, how many matches did we have? One, two, three, four, five, five. All right, so we had five states that overlapped. Sir, what was your question? Ten states in the Bible Belt. What is the Bible Belt? Someone tell me, what is the Bible Belt? Where most of the churches are. Where most of the churches are. All right. So where there are most churches, there should be mostly Christians. Fantastic. Matt, what was your question? Name ten states that have the worst reputation associated with racism. How in the world? How in the world can we have a group of states where the most churches are, and in turn, mostly God's people dwell, yet those same states have the worst reputation with hatred based upon skin color. Let that sink in for a second. How is that possible? I believe the reason for that is I believe not all people who would be called racist or have racist ideology believe that they are racist. A lot of people don't see their actions or statements or comments or Facebook posts as racist or hateful or evil. They see them as we're just talking the talk. Hey, this is how things are. This is the way things have always been, and this is the way they're always going to be. But it can't happen here in the church. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21, we have a situation where Paul has to confront a brother. And he confronts this brother because of a racial, ethnic issue that has happened. One day, Peter is just fine hanging out with the Gentiles. He's just fine eating with them, laughing with them, talking to them. I want you to imagine being a new Christian. You're a Gentile brought into this faith and told that this is a better way. This is a wonderful way. There's the one true God. We, we believe in Jesus. And as a matter of fact, you're at the table with Peter. Peter of all people, can you imagine how he, they must, Peter, tell us the story of the time you walked on water. Hey, hey Peter, tell us, tell us about the time you preached the first gospel sermon. I mean, they, they must have enjoyed being in unity with him until the circumcision party shows up. Other Jews show up. And then he says, I can no longer associate with you guys because I'm with them, and we don't associate with the likes of you. Overnight, and Paul has to address this because it's not okay. And this lets us know if it can affect Peter, if it can affect Peter, it can affect any of us. And I imagine if you were to ask Peter in that moment, hey, Peter, are you being racist right now? Well, absolutely not. No, I don't think it would have crossed his mind at all. But here we have a situation where someone openly turned his back on brothers and sisters in Christ because of where they were born or where they weren't born. The bloodline that they had or the bloodline that they didn't have. 
And that's not okay. In Acts chapter 6, we often look at this passage and talk about it being where the first deacons come from and, and, and how they had to be sent to, to wait on those tables. But what was the cause of this situation? The cause of the situation is we have some ladies that aren't being treated right, and it's because they're not like the other Jews there. Racially, they're different, and they're having to handle this situation because they're not being treated the way that they should be treated. I'm trying to point to you guys in the direction of knowing this is not American issues. This happened in Scripture long before America was even thought of. Hate, based on anything, has always been out there. But this is what uh, passages like 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 says. And this is one that you can't get around. This is one that you can't find a loophole through. This is one you can't talk your way out of. If a man says, I love God, but can also say, I hate my brother. He is a what? He's a what? You can't get around that. And not only does it say he's a liar, for he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has seen. It's impossible to be a Christian and hate. There's a lot of people, however, based upon our illustration, though, that haven't quite made that connection yet. I also want to point to this passage. Not only does it say, let your love be genuine, it says you need to hate evil things. Can we all agree that racism is evil? Then our reaction to it should be, I hate any and everything that's associated with that sinful, evil act of racism. So, here I have, oh, I'm not very good with PowerPoint, but I'm doing my best, all right? And so, I have this, this thing that I created where I see how the church is lumped into groups based upon racism. Let me tell you before I click a single thing, the issue is not one-sided, all right? It is not just a white people issue. There is hate on all sides of this situation, and we all have to work together to get past it. But I believe the hate that happens to be within the church is the minority. And so as we go through these different groups, all I want you to do is ask yourself, where do I stand in this? Y'all with me? Y'all with me? All right. Matt, do y'all amen much here? Depends on the mood. Depends on the mood? Okay. All right, just wondering. Hey, hey, yeah. It's okay if y'all amen every once in a while. In this group, we have the racist white Christian. This is the Christian who openly uses ugly words, nigger, monkeys, says them out loud, has no problem caring who hears. I hate black people. I can't stand Mexicans. I hate Jews. These are folks who exist in our world. And I'm seeing some wide eyes right now, like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. But they exist, and I imagine you know one or two. <laughs> they exist not only in the world, and remember, I'm not talking about there. I'm talking about in the body. And they openly have this hatred towards and you know what? They may not always come out and say it, but I have found that Facebook is like the window to the heart. Hey, you want to know who somebody is? 
go to their Facebook page and just scroll down a little bit. After you get past the encouraging scriptures, and then you start getting to some political things, you go, oh, and then you go a little bit further and you say, oh, and, and there you see the heart of somebody. We have folks in the body that are here, but we also have folks on this side. I hate white people. White people are the reason we're in this situation. Not just some white folks, but all white folks are rednecks and crackers. That's how this group refers and thinks. And I'm trying my best to keep it as real as possible. Let me know if I'm going too far, Matt. We're good? Okay. All right. I don't, all right. I just said that in front of a room of white people. <laughs> but we have this group that, again, you go on their Facebook page and you see who they really are. In both of these groups, most of their conversation, however, happens around family. Most of these conversations happen around Friends that have a like-minded view where they really dive in. And sometimes you've been a part of those conversations. But I believe these two groups are the smallest two groups. However, sometimes they're the most vocal. Here we have these two groups. The silent white Christian who is not racist at all but does not hate it. And whenever we're sitting at the Thanksgiving table, right, and old Uncle Jesse's here from Mississippi, (laughs) and he starts going on his rant about how Mexicans are ruining this country, and nobody at the table says anything, They look at each other crazy, like, oh, here he goes again. They look down, but no one says anything to old Uncle Jesse because we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to cause an issue. We don't want to have an argument this Thanksgiving. We finally want to have some peace. And so we say nothing. And that's a problem. On the other side, we got the silent minority. And if I can be a thousand percent honest with you, as I'm trying to be with everything else, that's where I've spent the majority of my life in this group because I figured out early, I figured out early how to be a successful black man in a white world. I figured out all it takes, here's the secret, y'all ready? You have to make sure the defenses of the white folks around you are down. And you do that by finding common ground. So I can watch a few episodes of The Office, right? And I can quote a few things. Hey, that gets a laugh. Hey, he's like us. I can watch Friends for a little while and start talking about Chandler and Monica, right? Oh, he's into the, hey, you turn on the radio, let's listen to some John Mayer, (laughs) right? We got a lot in common. I learned how to dress like white folks. I learned how to talk like white folks. And before you knew it, I was in there and I was successful and I was silent about the problems that hindered people like me from being just as successful because my thought process was, I figured it out, why can't you? Hey, maybe if you pulled your pants up, you'd be more successful. Maybe if you didn't have gold teeth, you'd be more successful. Maybe if you didn't dress that way, you'd be more successful. Maybe if, maybe if your sentences made a little bit more sense, you'd be more successful. And in that thought process, I was doing just as much damage as everybody else because I was being a silent minority where I could speak up and say, hey, this is not right. You shouldn't look at a job application and see, oh, it has a ghetto name. I'm going to throw it away. No, that's not okay. And I should have been able to speak up, and I am speaking up now. But I'll tell you, for the majority of my life, I was comfortable right here as being the only black guy in most of my circles. I was comfortable being successful 
and feeling like I was special somehow because I figured out the rules rather than helping rewrite the rules. And so we have these two groups on the very end, the openly and blatant racist people that are in the church, and then we have these silent Christians, which I think is the largest majority of folks in the body, people who see what's going on, people who are able to watch the news and see stuff ain't right, People are able to see things at work and how this happens. And this person who doesn't do anything at all keeps getting promoted. And these people who are working their tails off can't get, a, can't get a break. We're able to see how some of these things are happening. We're able to look back in history. We're able to look back at situations where black people had no chance of moving ahead. And some folks say, well, that's just the way it was. You got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We're able to look at how broken the system is and not say a word about it or not try to fix it. And yes, I expect that of folks out in the world, but in God's body, in Jesus' body, it can't happen that way. So I'm thinking, I'm feeling, I'm hoping and praying that most of us end up in this last group. It's not enough to say, I'm not racist. We have to be anti-racist. We have to oppose racism. We have to oppose hatred of any kind. We have to stand up to Uncle Jesse from Mississippi and say, we don't talk that way at this table. And when I'm at my table and I've got my cousins talking about those crazy white people they work with, I have to step up and say, hey, we don't talk that way at this table. You're a Christian and I'm a Christian. That's how the world talks, but we're different here. We're anti, we're anti, we're Christian. We're anti-racist. And wherever I go, everybody's going to know. So they're going to keep those Mexican jokes to themselves when I'm around. And they're going to keep those white people jokes to themselves when I'm around. And they're going to keep those women jokes to themselves when I'm around. Because I will have an uncomfortable conversation. I'm ready for it. I will rock the boat. I'm prepared for it. Because in any and all of those situations, I stand firm on God's word. And if I'm standing on that, you can't make me budge. And I'm hoping that as men and women, brothers and sisters in this room, this is where you stand. And if it's not, when you step foot out of here today, you have a new thought process, a new way of thinking about how you're going to relate to people and be able to say, yes, I'm not racist, but I'm more than that. I'm anti-racist. And that show through on your Facebook feeds. That shows through in your conversations you have, not only in your private conversations, but in your public conversations, that that does not fly here. We are the church. We are the example. The world is going to follow what we do. And if they look to us and they see just as much hatred as they see out there, blind leading the blind. We've had God's word to guide us for years and years and years. And in this country, there's been a lot of years where we just skipped over the passages where you could say, hey, it's impossible for you to love God and hate your brother. I don't know how we missed that for several years, but it got overlooked. But not anymore. I am proud to believe I stand in front of a bunch of white brothers and sisters who would gladly lock arms with me and say we're opposed to any type of racism. And I want you to know I didn't come here to make you feel guilty about what your ancestors might have done. I didn't come here to make you feel any kind of way about anything that's happened in the past or will happen. I came here to only talk to you about what it means to be a Christian and where we should stand on this issue. We hate it, we oppose it, we won't tolerate it. And let, me, let me just throw this, I wasn't going to mention this, but I'm going to mention it now. <laughs> Paul addressed it, and he also addressed it in that first passage that I, that I read, where it says, you've got these folks in the church with you that are doing these evil things, and you've said nothing to them. I imagine you all could get on Facebook right now and click on a family member's name 
co-worker's name that you go to church with or, or brother or sister in Christ's name, and there's some hateful things on that page. Scripture tells us that when we are caught in sin, it's up to who to get us out of that. Those who are righteous. If you see what they are saying and doing and fail to speak, you're guilty. Your inaction makes you guilty. So again, I am charging you. I'm calling on you. I'm calling on all of my brothers and sisters to not sit back and be quiet anymore but to boldly be anti-racist. Are there any questions? Um, right. There's been some progress, uh, but my lifetime is not quite as long as yours. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, I was at Freed Hardman uh, in 2006 is when I started. Uh, ended up leaving Freed four years later, uh, and I had issue after issue after issue. Uh, and all of them were my brothers. Um, but again, I was in that silent minority, and so I knew if I wanted to be successful here, I just had to take it. I just had to smile about it, I just had to move on, because if I didn't, I would get labeled as angry black guy. So I'm just going to grin, I'm going to bear it, I'm going to move on, I'm going to move out. Um, there have been times while I attended white congregations in Henderson where I would sit down on a pew and folks would leave. There were times where um, at Freed, I would get on an elevator and people would get off. Um, and I had to realize that not all of that was racism, though. Some of it was, I've never seen a black person. And I, I've had conversations with a lot of people who have come from areas where there were no black folks. And the only thing they saw was what was on TV. And I scared them to death. And so when I got on the elevator, their mind went to every rap video they'd ever seen and everything that's been portrayed on the news, and they, they did what they had to do. Uh, in that moment, I took it as racism. Uh, but looking at it through an older lens, um, I'm able to see it for a little bit more of what it really was. The church has made a huge change. Uh, in that, well, I'll say Freed has. I don't know if you guys were at the last lectureship where President Shannon came and he said what he said. Uh, for me and a lot of friends who had been to Freed, that was a breath of fresh air of thank you. And so the willingness to have a black guy come and speak and talk about racism uh, is much more than it was maybe five years ago, certainly 10 years ago. And so I would be foolish to stand up here and say, oh, no, there's not a lot of change happening, when clearly uh, there is. Is that also because of Brother Dom of creating the unity uh, between predominantly white churches and predominantly black churches? Is that a possibility? How do you do that? Uh, fantastic question. I preach at Jack's Creek Church of Christ. I am the black guy. And I get asked all the time, how did you end up? Uh, never mind. Um, and we've had that conversation. And being someone who has been to black congregations and white congregations, uh, I believe the issue is not race. I believe the issue is culture. And I've seen several congregations where they have a good mix of white and black people, 
but the culture is 100% white. The songs we sing are y'all songs. And I'm saying that as, you know, um, sweet is the song, singing today, I believe. Like, like that. And we can't sustain that until we have a merge of culture where when folks walk in, they feel at home um, more so than just seeing faces that look like theirs. And so I think for the most part, the aim has been on, well, let's, let's get more black people here and let's, let's try to integrate more and more and more and that's fine and that's great and that's wonderful, but until we start saying, okay, well, hey, what are some of the songs that you guys sing where you, at, your, at your home congregation? Lead some of those. And, and, and well, what was your Lord's Supper practice? And, and, and how did you do and start making somewhat of a creole of culture? Um, then I think that's when we hit the bingo. Uh, but that's real hard. And it's much easier to just focus on getting people to come than it is on giving up my tradition to allow yours to come in in its place. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I, I, my mother was in the Navy, and so I spent most of my life all over the country, from Egypt to Bermuda and all over the South and America, um, being at different places. I think you will find that it is easier for a white person to go to a black congregation than it is vice versa. Um, and I, I don't know why that is. Because I remember being at, at Oak Grove, and a white person walking in and be like, dude, dude, there's a white dude here. Come on in. Yeah, come on in. Hey, listen, we're going to sing some similar songs. We don't quite sing them like y'all sing them. But hey, come on in. And just it, It's more of that vibe. And, and then I've been on the other end where I've, I've ventured into a white congregation, and it was like, and, and don't let me amen at the wrong time. Right? And so it, 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 I don't know why that is. I don't know why that happens. Um, but I, I, I see it. And maybe you guys have seen that or felt that too. Right. Oh, great question. Yeah. Well, it's like what I said in here about our conversation and being openly opposed, right? And, and creating that zone of all it takes is for me and you to be around each other and someone make a black joke and me being in the silent minority just kind of laughing it off, but having you saying, hey, no, 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 that's not okay. Dude, we're friends for life now. And, and if you tell me uh, you want me to come to your congregation, now I'm thinking everybody there is like you, I'm there because I've seen it, I've heard it, I, I believe, I know your heart now. Uh, something else uh, that has really been a, a thing, uh, I said Facebook already, um, but I click your name and I see the stuff that you're into. Uh, and that can either say, hey, I'm about the Lord, I'm about his people, I'm about bringing folks to him. Or I'm about being a part of this party or that party. Or I'm about being a part of this group or that group. Or I'm not part of being like this or that. And so those things individually uh, often impact the church um, more so than we realize. Uh, I have to be aware that as a preacher, um, the things that I do not only affect me, but affect the congregation that I speak at. And until members realize they have that same Influence uh, to win people or to push people away, uh, I think we'll get a much better response when we take on that, that ownership we have of our influence privately. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Um, so there's, there's lessons learned from being in the silent minority. Um, and most has been knowing when to speak up and when to let things roll. Um, you guys are probably aware the past six months have been rough for race relations. I'm the black guy in my school, the only one. So if I roll up in there talking about Black Lives Matter, I'm going to rough some feathers. I'm going to turn some people away. I'm going to lose some influence, regardless how I feel, right? And so what I've done in there to kind of help the racial tensions that have happened is have more one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and less Let's blast and, and let's put all this stuff out there. But hey, let me pull you aside for a second. Let's have a conversation. Um, and those conversations have been amazing because in those conversations, I've learned a lot, just like the other person that I'm speaking to has learned a lot. And so they've learned, or I hope they respect me because of how I handle certain situations like that. Um, and I'm, I'm not looking to... I'm not looking to promote myself based upon an agenda. Is that, the, is that what you're asking? Gotcha. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'll tell you, the, the kids are the key to the hearts of the adults. You take care of somebody's baby, it don't matter how much I hate black folks. You take care of my baby, I kind of like you, right? And so that has, has worked. And I've been in that, that county for a long time where I've taken care of a lot of people's babies to now I'm taking care of babies of the babies I've taken care of. And there's nothing like being in Walmart before COVID and you're walking through and somebody's white child runs up to you and goes, Mr. Kirk, and hugs. And you're looking at those parents and you know what they're thinking. What in the world? Right? But that child, right, regardless of what's being taught at home, regardless of what they've seen or heard from Uncle Jesse, well, all of that stuff, I don't care. I love Mr. Kirk because he's, he's good to me and we have fun and we're able to talk. And so I look at my position there as an opportunity to shadow stereotypes, to shadow, uh, shatter anything that you've been fed and let you know I love you and I care about you and not all black people are bad, not all white people are bad, we're in this together and uh, as I reach them, I'm also reaching the families. Absolutely. So I I've just been given the signal. Um, <laughs> I've, I've really appreciated this opportunity. Um, and hopefully, uh, we can all leave here with, with that mentality of, and I hope that's a word that sticks with you forever now, anti-racist, anti-racist, anti-racist. Um, I don't know where you are in your, your walk with Christ. I don't know the troubles you may have felt, the struggles you've had with COVID. Um, but I'm telling you, I've needed Jesus more in the past three months than I've ever needed him before. I pride myself on being a good administrator. But the rules have been changed. And I found myself the other day having to tell a little girl, baby, you've been in contact with someone that has COVID-19. And now I have to isolate you. And in that conversation, I'm watching this fourth grade girl fall apart because in her mind, she's hearing death sentence. And I'm trying to put her back together. And the whole time that's happening, I'm thinking, what am I doing? How did I get here? What is happening right now? I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. I've got adults, my teachers calling me at home saying, Mr. Kirk, this has happened and I need you to tell me what to do. I'm not calling my husband right now. I'm not calling my father right now. I'm calling you. I need you to help me through this life or death situation. Tell me what to do. 
And I'm getting to the point where I'm just thinking, forget it. I, I, I can go greet folks at Walmart. I, I can do something else. But this right here, I'm not ready for. And I found myself praying. And I found myself really pouring out to God saying, this is, I can't do this anymore. And it's as the Spirit works in such a beautiful way to kind of remind you of Scripture that you've read. And I remember thinking, TJ, do you have faith in Jesus? Yes. TJ, if you have faith in Jesus, then I need you to get up. I need you to get in your car. I need you to drive to work. And I need you to be the leader I put you in that building to be. I need you to listen to folks who are scared. I need you to pray with those who are broken. I need you to counsel those who need direction. I need you to step up and be the man I put you in that building to be because I could have put anybody in there, but I put you. So I need you to get in there and I need you to do it. I need you to suck it up. I need you to pray to me when you're broken. I need you to come to me when you've got sorrows and weary. But after that, I need you to get up and I need you to go counsel those babies and help them through this hard time. We've done a lot of great things at Chester County Middle School over the years, but I'm telling you right now, I'm more proud of what we're doing because I can honestly say I'm doing it only through the power of the Lord. There's nothing about TJ that's getting me through this. It's only Jesus. And I'm telling you and I'm asking you right now, if you need to be brought back into the fold, if you need to get your relationship with him better again, this is the opportunity to do it because that faith that I have is all that's gotten me through this time. And if you're trying to make it without it, I feel bad for you you're not going to last long. If you have need of being restored, if you have need of being baptized, if you have need of just, I need someone to pray for me right now. Please let it be known as we stand and sing Song of Encouragement.